January of this year, an American soldier in Iraq has seen enough. He's disgusted by what some of his fellow soldiers have done to people they came to liberate. In his hand, a bombshell. It's about to be delivered to his commanders. A CD filled with hundreds of graphic images of the torture of prisoners. They started torturing us. We did not know each time where the blow would come from. We had bags on our heads. I was kicked in the jaw and it's still broken. They overchose the sensitive parts of the body. The Red Cross are the only outsiders to inspect prison conditions in Iraq. Now they give their first in-depth interview to Panorama. I think that has been shown through the photographs that have become public. There were uh, behaviors, there was treatment that was degrading and inhumane that appeared to look for uh, humiliation of the detainees. That clearly, in, in our view, was tantamount to torture. Today, in Baghdad, saw the start of the first court-martial of a US soldier. Jeremy Sivitz, a 24-year-old military policeman, has been jailed for maltreating detainees. The Bush administration says the abuse was un-American, the work of a few bad apples. Tonight, using reconstructions, we hear the testimony of the US soldiers accused of torture. I've asked for help and warned of this. Nobody would listen. I told the battalion commander that I didn't like the way it was going. And his reply was, don't worry about it. I give you permission to do it. Since 9-11 and the deaths of 3,000 people, America has adopted a hard-line approach to the way it collects intelligence about its enemies. This is a very highly classified area, but I have to say that all you need to know is that there was a before 9-11 and there was an after 9-11. After 9-11, the gloves come off. A British detainee, captured during the US War on Terror, speaks out for the first time on television about his experience at the hands of Americans. Put you in chains, shackles, you, they, they cut into your feet and your hands. Um, I mean, Any time they want, they can attack you. And basically, you're like a slave. Tonight, we investigate the scale of abuse by US forces and their British allies in Iraq. The torture is not confined to one prison or one country. As the full story continues to emerge, we question what part was played by some top brass in the US military and leading members of the Bush administration. Seven US military police are accused of abusing Iraqi prisoners at Abu Ghraib. Some have given their own version of events in letters home and in testimony to army investigators. Most claim those above them in the military chain of command knew what they were doing and encouraged it. Dear Mimi, I'm feeling so bad at how the army has come down on me. They always said that shit rolls downhill. And guess who's at the bottom? I've asked for help and warned of this. Nobody would listen. The soldier accused of being one of the ringleaders, Staff Sergeant Ivan Frederick, blames MI, military intelligence at the prison, for what happened. The military working dogs were used to intimidate prisoners as MI's request. A CID agent told the soldier working 1A to stress one prisoner out as much as possible, that he wanted to talk to him the next day. Another of the MPs or military police involved in the ritual humiliation of prisoners claims her colleagues were just untrained reservists doing what their superiors ordered. They would bring in one to several prisoners at a time already hooded and cuffed. The job of the military police was to keep them awake. 
make it hell so they would talk. Cumberland, Maryland, the home base of the American military police unit at the heart of the abuse scandal. Their families and friends are God-fearing people, shocked by what their own have done. These past couple of weeks, we have seen pictures that have absolutely horrified us. When people lose their compass of right and wrong, something is disturbingly wrong. And we as a community together say, we are sorry this occurred. Opinions here in small town America are divided over the scandal that has stained Hi, Ron, the reputation of the U.S. Hi, Army. Darlene, how are you? I think Rumsfeld should resign. It was on his watch. It happened under him. A select few of our troops have given people in Iraq a poor view of what a democratic life could mean and what we are ultimately trying to help bring to them. Hi there, Sarah. How are you today? Not every Arab is a bad person. And it's kind of funny because I always say that, you know, not every Muslim is a terrorist, but every terrorist is Muslim. Most of the soldiers caught up in this scandal came from this remote corner of Appalachia, hard-pressed, conservative communities, which traditionally have provided many troops for the U.S. armed forces. Kerry Shoemaker Davis served with the now notorious military police unit for four years. Her husband still on active duty at Abu Ghraib. She knows many of those accused of torturing Iraqis. Her best friend is Private Lindy England, the 21-year-old who has become the face of the scandal. I met her when she first came to the unit. I was assigned to be her sponsor. Sweet girl, loved to have a good time, very compassionate, very generous, just would bend over backwards to try and help somebody. Not at all what we see in the pictures. If I could talk to her today, I would just smack her right upside of her head and ask her, what the hell were you thinking? And I, I cried. I cried when I saw those pictures. Lindy England's home is this trailer park, but she's now in military detention, one of seven soldiers so far facing courts martial. The reservist from rural America who enlisted just to pay for her education and ended up in Iraq, told a local TV station she was simply following orders. I was told to stand there, point, give a thumbs up, smile, look at the camera, take the picture. Who told you to do that? Persons in my higher chain of command. To us, we were doing our job, which meant we were doing what we were told and the outcome was what they wanted. Private England's fiance, specialist Charles Grainer, is also accused of torturing Iraqis. England is five months pregnant with his child. Grainer lived here in Uniontown, Pennsylvania. The reservist is a prison guard in civilian life. A divorced father of two, the entrance to Grainer's home bears witness to his belief in a righteous God. To me, he was a hard-working person. Took good care of his kids when I, what I could see. They were clean, fed. Took my grandkids and would take care of them overnight. Uh, I would trust him with them. I know there was no problem with not trusting him with the kids. It's just not the person I that left Union Town that's in them pictures. The Charles Grainer in the photos from Iraq seems to relish what he's doing, though he claims he was just the pawn of military intelligence. He was told to uh, go along with the instructions from the intelligence command because they were in charge. When he complained to the military intelligence people about what he was being told to do, they told him that, hey, you're just an MP, do what we say, you work for us. So he complied. Abu Ghraib, the prison at the center of the scandal. 
the officer in charge of the jail and all Iraq's detainee facilities, was Brigadier General Janice Kapinski. She was the commander of the Reserve Military Police Unit at Abu Ghraib. General Karpinski's been officially admonished. She's blamed by some for what her MPs have done. I thought I was going to get sick when I saw the photographs. I actually saw them. They were worse than I could have imagined. And uh, I was shocked that the MPs would be involved in such things, that they would, that they would allow themselves to be involved. These pictures have had a, a devastating effect. I mean, they have destroyed America's image. And some would hold you responsible, others in the chain of command overall in the American army. I've never run from responsibility, and I'm not running from responsibility this time. But I know my MPs and I know my soldiers well enough to know that there was an influence, a very strong influence, to make them do these kind of things. Are you saying higher up? Yes, I am. How high? I don't know how high it goes. To the Pentagon, to the Defense Secretary himself, Mr. Rumsfeld? I don't know. For America, the invasion of Iraq was part of the war on terror. There was never any strategic planning for what might follow. Coalition forces quickly found themselves handling thousands of prisoners of war and problems arose almost immediately. According to a leaked Red Cross report, the Bush administration and their British allies were being warned about a pattern of abuse of Iraqi detainees from last May onwards. It was in particular uh, the um, people who were considered as having high intelligence value that were undergoing uh, some of the severe uh, elements of treatment that we described. Um, but I think, in, in general, a pattern that we consider su sufficient concern to submit very clearly to the authorities. Yes. So you submitted very clearly your concerns to the authorities? And in repeated fashion, yes. In the south, the British army had responsibility, first for prisoners of war and then all Iraqis in detention. The Geneva Conventions, which govern the conduct of armies in war, state that prisoners in the protection of occupying forces must be treated humanely. But detainees in the British sector were routinely hooded. The British stopped the practice last September. In May 2003, allegations began emerging of the abuse of prisoners by both US forces and British soldiers. So you were visiting British-run uh, detention facilities routinely in the South for several months? Yes, we were. Yes. And you found as a result of that that there were abuses and breaches of the Geneva Convention in that part of Iraq, which was controlled by the British forces? Yes, we had elements that, uh, in terms, uh, again, of um, the um, conditions and treatment there that were worrying uh, at the time and that had been uh, of, of significant concern. British forces based themselves in Basra, Iraq's major city in the south. Troops rounded up suspected Ba'athists and Saddam's militiamen. But they also arrested many petty criminals and innocent civilians. Damaging allegations of abuse were made against the Queen's Lancashire Regiment, with photographs published in the Daily Mirror. Those pictures were shown to be fakes, never taken in Iraq. But that same regiment is still tainted by accounts of how some of its soldiers treated one civilian. Dawood Musa is a colonel in the Iraqi police force. Today he looks after the orphaned children of his late son, Baha. He worked in the evening at the hotel and kept his days free to look after his children because his wife passed away six months before him. She left him Al Hussein and Al Hassan. They were four and five years old. On September the 14th, 2003, Baha Musa was arrested by soldiers from the Queen's Lancashire Regiment during a raid on the hotel. Kifa Taha was one of several others arrested with him. They locked us in the bathroom, pushed us to the floor, and pressed our heads down with their boots. 
they humiliated us. They screened abuse at us, like, fuck you, pigs, foolish, stupid, and they seemed to be enjoying it. They were laughing. The men were taken to a British military prison. There, Bahu Musa and Kifa Taha received savage beatings. Mr. Taha was so badly injured that he spent two months in a British military hospital. Now he needs kidney dialysis. They started torturing us without questioning us. The type of torture, well, they were kickboxing us with pleasure. I heard the last screams of Baha before his voice disappeared. During the first two days, Baha was only a meter away from me. I could hear him and see him. He would moan and wail from the severity of his torture. He was really badly tortured. The army wouldn't hand over Baha's body until a British professor carried out the autopsy. In brief, he told me that your son has three ribs broken, the seventh, eighth and the ninth rib. This was in addition to the broken nose and the bruises. He also told me that your son died of strangulation done by a piece of cloth. The family say the military authorities wanted changes to the death certificate. The cause of death in the certificate was indicated as heart seizure. I said I won't accept this death certificate until you write in it that he died from strangulation, just as the professor indicated. Just days later, a local sheikh presented the family's evidence about Musa's alleged killing to two of the British Army's most senior generals at this meeting in Basra. The Ministry of Defence say that a Royal Military Police inquiry into Mr. Musa's death has been conducted and their report is currently being considered with legal advice. But no one has been charged. The Red Cross raised the case of Baha Musa shortly after his death last September. It's just one of many cases of maltreatment which they reported at the time to the British authorities. From what you're saying, it seems clear that uh, you made your concerns known to the authorities in this instance in the South, who, who were the British coalition forces. Yes, we made our, our concerns known, uh, indeed, repeatedly, and, 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 and on, as on other occasions and in other instances, we asked for corrective measures to be taken. And were those corrective measures taken? In a number of instances, yes. We submitted those findings, as you indicate, uh, very early, and again repeatedly. In some regions, indeed in the South, uh, measures were taken fairly rapidly and, and we felt, uh, in, to a large extent, our recommendations were taken seriously. As the British Army got to grips with abuses in the South late last summer, the insurgency in central Iraq was rapidly becoming a major problem for their ally. US forces controlled Baghdad and the rebellious Sunni Triangle. The Americans were detaining so many Iraqis, they were forced to reopen Saddam's largest and most infamous prison. Abu Ghraib had been a death camp for those who offended the regime. All Iraqis knew and feared the place where thousands had been tortured and murdered. One survivor describes his treatment at Abu Ghraib in Saddam's days. I was hanged from my hands tied at the, at the back to the ceiling for hours at a time and I was giving um, electric shocks on different parts of the body, on the sensitive parts of the body and I was beaten um, very severely. It had a notorious reputation for torture and for uh, just incarcerating people for long years at a time without any uh, real evidence. 
there were no other choices. In fact, it was the only location with maximum security cells and isolation cells. There was chaos from the moment Abu Ghraib reopened last July. Within weeks, US military police, with no specialist training, were running a civilian prison, struggling to control 6,000 detainees. Their relatives had no idea who was being held here. Many of the detainees were innocent or just petty criminals. The bombing of the United Nations in Iraq at the end of August heralded the start of a new level of violence. Saddam had not been caught. Resistance was mounting and becoming increasingly organized. Islamic militants using suicide bombs began to take their toll of US lives. The Americans were badly rattled. The message came down from the Pentagon to US forces in Iraq. They wanted more actionable intelligence. These raids were picking up. The number of detainees were holding was increasing. Collecting that actionable intelligence was the job of a different, more shadowy set of soldiers in Abu Ghraib. Military intelligence, or MI in army parlance. They interrogated detainees to gain information, to enable them to penetrate the insurgents' networks and save American lives. The MI interrogation teams, I think, were facing uh, tremendous pressure to get results. They, um, pressure from where? Well, from the headquarters, and I don't know how high up it went, but there was definitely pressure being placed on them to work more, uh, longer hours, uh, more vigorously, get what you can. The Pentagon decided to dispatch a man well-versed in the business of interrogation to Iraq. Major General Jeffrey Miller, the commander of Guantanamo Bay. Nearly 600 detainees are held in this US prison camp in Cuba, in a legal limbo without time limits. Interrogation is the main purpose of Guantanamo. JTF Guantanamo's mission is to detain enemy combatants and develop intelligence for our nation and our allies to help win the global war on terror. So we, de we detain these enemy combatants uh, to be able to accomplish that mission in as quickly as time as possible. Every night at the open-air movie theater beyond the prison, the troops salute the flag. I do solemnly swear to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies so help me God. So Post 9-11, the U.S. set up this detention facility outside the Geneva Conventions. In his first television interview, a British detainee, now released, gives his account of what happened here. You're in a cage. It's about eight foot by four foot. Sometimes there's nothing in your cell. You have no toilet paper or soap or anything to keep clean. Anywhere you go, they put you in chains. You're treated like it didn't exist. At Guantanamo, senior camp commanders called for an official review of their interrogation techniques, a so-called matrix, designed to obtain intelligence from detainees. They were determined to make their regime as efficient as possible at extracting information, but they insist it is humane. Everything was by force. It was all a humiliation. They would search out our private parts. Uh, they would pretend search us, which would consist of them putting their hands over uh, me and anyone's private parts. Detainees say that General Miller introduced short shackling, a practice where detainees were forced to squat with hands chained between their legs and then to the floor. You would be, you'd be put in like a cross-leg position, uh, sitting down, and they would actually pull the chains towards the pin in the floor, so there would be no slack. So you would be able to lean back or move left or right. 
I mean, you won't be given nothing. I mean, no food, toilet. You get cramps, unbearable pain. I would have to scream and shout, and uh, nothing will be done. In Guantanamo, pictures were regularly taken of the detainees, as they would be later in Iraq. And if prisoners did not comply with camp rules, the extreme reaction force could be sent in. Videos were taken. They sprayed me in my eye, my left eye, and down my cheek with pepper spray, and left me to vomit and they'll be filming this outside. I could actually see with one eye what was happening. There'll be a, like five guys outside, then a guy holding the video camera, and they would charge in with a, with a front plastic shield and then just force me to the floor, stick their knee into my back, and force my head in a toilet and flush it. The Red Cross has visited Guantanamo several times in the past two years. They've revealed to Panorama they're worried about what goes on here. There are elements of the treatment at Guantanamo Bay that give you cause for concern. Well, there were elements of treatment that we raised in our discussions with the Americans as, as um, we seeing a need for corrective measures to be taken. A need for corrective measures? Yes that they should change things because they are not acceptable. Yes, we did submit in consistent uh, reports uh, to the US authorities findings and concerns on our part uh, in, over the recent uh, months. In late August 2003, General Miller was ordered from Guantanamo to Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq. His task, to investigate how the strategic interrogation of prisoners there could be enhanced. The US Senate is carrying out investigations into Iraqi prisoner abuses. They've revealed just how high level the involvement was in General Miller's mission to Iraq. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony that you are The top to military man in the US, the General Myers, admitted it Senate. was a Pentagon initiative. We kind of pushed General Miller on him in uh, August for of sure. 03 to look because he was so successful in Guantanamo look at our detention operations to make sure we're doing it right and there were also um, that it's well connected that the intel is getting to the analyst and so forth so we can uh, win this win now was this in response to any media complaints or was oh, it on your own initiative that was our own initiative and that Go was ahead. a discussion between the secretary and myself and our staff we had then in Iraq a large body of people who had been captured on the battlefield that we had to gain intelligence from for force protection purposes and he was asked to go over in my encouragement to take a look at the situation as it existed there I have a lot of confidence so general miller was sent to iraq with the blessing of donald rumsfeld and the military high command in september the defense secretary himself visited iraq Mr. Rumsfeld was shown around Saddam's notorious prison by General Karpinski. But the same day, General Miller was also here, behind the scenes, and running into flak with Abu Ghraib's commander. That was the first time I, I heard him use the expression that they were going to get Moais the operation. And I said, sir, I don't know what that means. And he said, we're going to put the procedures in place like they are in Guantanamo Bay. He said that we're going to take Abu Ghraib and uh, focus our interrogation efforts out there. Again, I said to him, sir, Abu Ghraib is not mine to give you. So it was in a meeting and he cleared the room and uh, he said to me, look, we can do this my way or we can do this the difficult way. And uh, we're going to take Abu Ghraib. After General Miller's visit, Military intelligence was given control of a wing of Abu Ghraib. This change was formalized by a special military order from the US commander of coalition forces in Iraq. It came as a shock to General Karpinski. I found out several days after the order had been cut. So you're a prison effectively being taken away from you? That particular facility, that's right. And uh, 
Why do you think that was? Well, I don't, well, because of the interrogation effort and because General Miller had told me in September that he was going to take Abu Ghraib. In January, a soldier came forward to give evidence of the abuses at Abu Ghraib. A secret investigation by General Toguba revealed what General Miller had recommended to the Pentagon should happen at the prison. Miller believed operations should be humane, but stated, It is essential that the Guard Force be actively engaged in setting the conditions for successful exploitation of the internees. And he believed that Detention operations must act as an enabler for interrogation. The traditional firewall between guards responsible for the prisoner's welfare and intelligence responsible for interrogation was taken down. The 205th Military Intelligence Brigade took over Block 1A, once used by Saddam's torturers. General Miller had left behind Pentagon-approved rules for changing the prison regime. Military police, reservists with little training, would now become involved in military interrogation. General Miller has subsequently insisted his rules were within the Geneva Conventions. Last night he was in Iraq. Uh, I saw him and he said that he was going to leave uh, a CD with lesson plans and printed information and they, the MPs who were going to be supporting the interrogation effort would be given specific training, additional training. In other words, how to move detainees, um, how to handle them specifically. Uh, I don't think that training was ever conducted, at least to my knowledge it was never conducted. But the interrogation effort um, seem to become more vigorous. Many in the prison were innocent, though some were criminals and Iraqi insurgents. The Abu Ghraib inquiry claimed General Miller was using Guantanamo operational procedures as baselines. Baselines aimed at terrorists. Yet Taguba stated the people in Abu Ghraib were not believed to be international terrorists. Did you point out to General Miller that you were not dealing with suspected terrorists in Abu Ghraib as they were in Guantanamo and that perhaps things were slightly different? Well, he looked at the security detainees as a population of likely terrorists or potential terrorists, knowing that there was likely terrorists among that, amongst that population at the time. Um, he didn't make a distinction. Do you think he should have done? Uh, can't second guess him, but certainly in my mind there's a difference between a terrorist and somebody that is uh, uh, busting through a checkpoint past the curfew hour. By October 2003, pictures like this were being taken at dead of night on the wing where military interrogators and military police were now working together. What do you know? Haida Saba Abid was one of the victims on that wing. In the autumn of 2003, some of the photos captured his ordeal. He's pictured here with Lindy England. We didn't know where they were taking us because our heads were covered. They would slam us against the wall and would scream at us. Whenever we were near a wall or a door, they would slam us against it. Whenever someone fell, they would drag him. Soldiers doing this were from the 372nd Company. The Cumberland unit arrived at Abu Ghraib at the beginning of October. Inexperienced reservists found themselves in an overcrowded prison in a war zone, mortared daily. Morale was low, discipline poor. There were incidents of alcohol abuse and sexual abandon. From the moment the 372nd arrived to guard the prisoners, things went badly awry. And they started torturing us, beating us. They punched and kicked. They would press on our heads with their shoes. They stood on our backs. The weather was cold at the time, and they would throw cold water at us. We did not know where the blows would come from, because our heads were covered. They would kick us on our heads and in the genitals. Although the photographs publicly seen so far show acts of physical and sexual humiliation, 
The Toguba inquiry also quotes instances of torture, which included... Forcing groups of male detainees to masturbate themselves. A male military police guard having sex with a female detainee. Beating detainees with a broom handle and a chair. Sodomizing a detainee with a chemical light and perhaps a broomstick. According to the Toguba report, two military policemen were particularly prominent in the abuse scandal, Sergeant Ivan Frederick and Specialist Charles Grainer. Toguba described them as born leaders. In civilian life, they are both corrections officers at US prisons. In their defense, their lawyers claim that they were only following orders. The officers within the 205th Military Intelligence Brigade who gave the orders to set up these photographs, to uh, abuse the prisoners, if you will. The people who gave those orders clearly are at fault. Uh, but I, I don't think it stops just with them. Uh, above them would have been people who created the climate that allowed this to be done. Testimony given to army investigators by Grainer and Frederick's fellow accused does appear to support their claim that military intelligence officers at Abu Ghraib were involved in the abuse. They were all naked. A bunch of guys from military intelligence and the military police there that night. A Sergeant Grainer and Sergeant Frederick ordered the guys while questioning them to admit what they did. Military intelligence wanted to get them to talk. It is Grainer and Frederick's job to do things for MI and other government agencies and get these people to talk. What did you hear military intelligence saying to Grainer and Frederick? Loosen this guy up to make sure he has a bad night, make sure he gets the treatment. All of us who were, have, have been charged, we all agree that we don't feel like we were doing things that we weren't supposed to because we were told to do them. We think everything was justified because we were instructed to do this and to do that. Lindy England's former commander, herself criticized in the scandal, believes the MPs were being manipulated by others when taking the photographs. When you have a photograph, a picture really is worth a thousand words. And it just seems peculiar that they seem um, almost staged. Uh, if the MPs were afraid of being caught doing these things, it would have been faster, more disorganized. Uh, you know, I think you would have seen that urgency, quick take the picture before somebody comes by. But they seem to be uh, too comfortable or too relaxed, as if don't worry about it because everybody knows that needs to know and this is okay. Suggesting that they were comfortable because someone had told them to do it. Yes. And and they were simply following those instructions. That very month, October, the Red Cross visited Abu Ghraib, and as their leaked report later revealed, they began to hear about some aspects of the abuse from prisoners. Well, what you saw from the report that was uh, made public was um, there were elements uh, such as um, hooding, there were elements such as being kept for long periods in total darkness and uh, in, in, uh, in naked. Those were some of the, the findings that, that we reported back on. And instances of deliberate humiliation of prisoners? Well, those, some of these are, are clearly uh, cases of, of humiliation where, where the, uh, people were placed and paraded uh, naked, uh, according to the findings, in front of um, either other inmates or the guards. Those are certainly elements that were part of uh, those patterns of concern, yes. And in front of female guards sometimes with, for example, women's underwear on their heads, as you've detailed in the report. That those were certainly what some of the cases that were reported, yes. Many of the victims say the torture meted out to them centered on inexplicable sexual humiliations. We wouldn't take our clothes off, so they brought a knife and started slicing through our clothes. Then we were naked in front of the American soldiers. There were men and women among them. They made them do all kinds of strange exercises, call them all kinds of names, such as gays, do they like to? 
have sex with guys. And then they handcuffed the hands together and, and their legs with shackles and started to stack them up, stack them up on top of each other by, by ensuring that the bottom guy's penis would touch the guy on top's butt. To those who've dealt with the victims of torture worldwide, these scenes fit a well-documented and illegal psychological approach to interrogation. The particular soldiers didn't invent these ideas. These are, these are techniques that are done in concert. They have been adapted to the local context where they are particularly humiliating and particularly shaming to that population of people. I think that bringing women into the interrogation room, particularly for male Muslim prisoners, is a particularly difficult and, and humiliating process for them. It's intended to help break them. Do you know why they wanted you to do that? Because I'm a female, and in the Muslim culture, it's very embarrassing or humiliating to be naked in front of another female, especially if it's an American. Pictures were taken routinely, a record of their shame which could be used against a detainee and to intimidate others. We were tortured for two hours and this woman was a present. During the torture they were taking pictures but we didn't know who they were for. They beat us for two hours and then they spent two hours taking photographs. These are only part of what there is. There are more photographs. There has been some suggestion that the pictures were used for other interrogations, that these staged photographs would be shown to new arrivals and they would be used as a kind of a cut to the chase intimidation factor. Um, this may be your eventual uh, situation unless you speak now. So who were the military intelligence officers that the MPs claim ran the interrogations? A separate investigation is now examining their role. But General Taguba identified two leaders of the 205th Military Intelligence Brigade. He states that Colonel Thomas Pappas and Lieutenant Colonel Steve Jordan with others are directly or indirectly responsible for the abuses at Abu Ghraib. The military policeman Charles Grainer is facing charges of assault and committing indecent acts with prisoners. His lawyer believes that one of the photographs taken in Block 1A is different and will prove that military intelligence and others were directing abuse there. Specialist Grainer emailed this photograph to me from Iraq and Prior to emailing it, he numbered all of the nine people pictured in the photograph. The first one, at the very forefront, wearing uh, black gloves with his hands on his hips, uh, is Specialist Grainer himself, and he's watching uh, as they set the scene, if you will, for this interrogation. Four and five are military intelligence officers. We believe they're of the rank of either uh, specialist or sergeant. Numbers seven and eight, you can see only their feet. These are military intelligence officers uh, of the rank of staff sergeant or sergeant first class. But we have a photograph that was actually taken and it was not set up by the military intelligence officers. They did not realize that they were actually in this photograph. The man bending over the Iraqis is believed to be one of several civilian interpreters working to the intelligence officers. Specialist Grainer was directed to undress those prisoners. That was very explicit. He was told to have them lie down on the floor and embrace themselves. And of course we can tell from the photograph that the civilian intelligence employee, number two, came over and grabbed them by the neck and was adjusting the pile himself to make sure the photograph was exactly as they wanted. That's pretty specific. Taguba has identified two private civilian contractors as also being responsible directly or indirectly for the abuse at Abu Ghraib. John Israel, one of the civilians named by Taguba, worked for a subcontractor of Titan, a Californian company, which provides interpreters in Iraq. Taguba slammed Mr. Israel for not having the required military security clearances. 
The second civilian, Stephen Stefanowicz, a former naval intelligence officer, was working for Khaki, a private Washington company. He was an interrogator at the prison. The activities of both Khaki and Titan, which work closely together, caused General Toguba deep concern. In general, U.S. civilian contract personnel, Titan Corporation, Khaki, etc., third country nationals, and local contractors do not appear to be properly supervised within the detention facility at Abu Ghraib. Taguba's report into Abu Ghraib, which clearly identified Israel and Stefanowicz as responsible for the abuses at the prison, reached CENTCOM in March this year. But we have evidence that Stefanowicz was still working at Abu Ghraib one month later. Joe Ryan, another khaki interrogator, kept a diary of his daily life at the prison. His entry for April 26, 2004, two days before the scandal broke, placed Stefanovic still firmly at the prison. I got to take the rest of the day off after our long booth time. This gave us a nice evening to head to the roof and play around a golf. Scott Norman, Steve Stefanowitz, and I all took turns trying to hit balls over the back wall and onto the highway. We do what we can to make it fun here. An American civilian contractor who worked with Mr. Stefanovic in Iraq told us the chain of command in the prison was confused. This contractor also worked for Khaki at the time. Contractors were generally under the command of military commanders on site. However, this was not so evident as the majority of procedures were guided by the interrogators and analysts themselves. The main focus of accountability to the command was what type of intelligence was being generated, not about how it was being obtained. Let me just say to you, that the actual monitoring of the interrogations, while they occurred, there was minimal supervision. As by and large, interrogators were free to conduct the interrogations as they saw fit. Senators in Washington have demanded to know why the US was contracting out military interrogations. They've demanded of the defense secretary himself why there appeared to be so little control over these contractors. I'd like to know what agencies or private contractors were in charge of interrogations, did they have authority over the guards, and what were their instructions to the guards? First, uh, uh, with respect to the... We did not bring it. Oh my. Yeah, oh my, is right. I, it was all prepared. It was, indeed. Secretary Rumsfeld, in all due respect, You've got to answer this question, and it could be satisfied with a phone call. This is a pretty simple, straightforward question. Who was in charge of the interrogations? What agencies and what or private contractors were in charge of the interrogations? Did they have authority over the guards? And what were the instructions to the guards? This goes to the heart of this matter. It does indeed. The Taguba report blamed the abuses on a failure of leadership at brigade level in Iraq a lack of training, discipline, and supervision. But others disagree and want to know if the Pentagon authorized the unleashing of military intelligence officers at Abu Ghraib. As for the culpability of the MPs who claim they were just following orders, there are apparently other pictures and videos which show rape scenes involving US soldiers and Iraqi detainees. Did things happen in this prison to those Iraqi prisoners worse than what we've seen <coughs> in these photographs? Yes. Can you tell me about that? No. There are reports of photographs showing England having consensual sex with multiple partners in front of prisoners, acts which do not fit her explanation. She was only following orders. When the photographs were released, they caused a wave of anger across the Middle East. Many felt that America had lost its moral authority. I think these photographs have done the biggest service to the um, Al-Qaeda kind of people to prove to them that um, their war against the US or the West is based on their 
up her moral values and um, this is how these people look at the Muslims, this is how they treat Muslims and um, I don't think that um, this should have been allowed to happen. The American president himself had to apologize to Iraqis and to Arab allies who supported America's war on terror. Americans like me didn't appreciate what we saw and it made us sick to our stomachs. We regret very much that these events ever occurred and apologize to those who are victims of the abuse. To those Iraqis who were mistreated by members of the U.S. Armed Forces, I offer my deepest apology. I offer my deepest apology. I don't know how far up the chain of command it goes, but I sure want to find out. And uh, that's what the investigation is going to do. And then I want to see those held responsible. And I don't want them all blaming it on seven army privates who are low-level guys and trying to whitewash the thing. As the crisis has developed in recent days, it's become clear that the abuses of Abu Ghraib are far from unique in Iraq. The Red Cross has concerns about at least four other prisons. And were the abuses that you noted in Iraq more widespread than just Abu Ghraib prison? Yes, through the findings uh, that we submitted, it appears clearly that uh, not only were the, the, these patterns not limited to uh, the acts of a few individuals acting simply in isolation, uh, but also uh, were clearly more widespread uh, throughout uh, Iraq. There were other places of detention that we visited, and there were references uh, to problems there that we reported in the same fashion. As the investigations gather momentum, far worse abuses are beginning to emerge in Iraq and elsewhere. This photo shows a frozen corpse, crudely wrapped in plastic. The man died at Abu Ghraib, but his identity is a mystery. Sergeant Ivan Frederick, one of the defendants in the Abu Ghraib case, began keeping a secret diary once he knew he was being investigated. The following is thought to be a description of the killing of the man in the photograph. Back around November, another government agency's prisoner was brought to 1A. They stressed him out so bad the man passed away. They put his body in a body bag and packed him in ice for approximately 24 hours. The next day, the medics came in, put his body on a stretcher, placed a fake IV in his arm and took him away. This OGA was never processed and therefore Never had a number. General Taguba's report speaks of ghost detainees, people deliberately hidden from the Red Cross and others. Men and women in detention being interrogated, who have no names, no numbers, no existence in the system at Abu Ghraib. This maneuver was deceptive, contrary to army doctrine, and in violation of international law. The pattern of deaths, torture and abuse in U.S. custody does not stop at the Iraqi border. In Afghanistan, thousands of people have been detained since the start of the war on terror. Bagram Air Base near Kabul, the headquarters of the coalition forces in Afghanistan, and site of one of the largest U.S. detention facilities. The British citizen, Tariq Dugul, was held here for a month in 2002. I was interrogated at gunpoint. I was beaten by an interrogator. I was refused medical treatment, which led to my toe being amputated. I was stripped, searched. Um, a full search was done on me. Pictures were taken. I was in a cage. You wasn't allowed to talk to anyone. I could see people opposite, guys hung up by their hands and they were screaming and shots were being fired. And this was uh, every day. A US military spokesman told us that detainees in Bagram are treated in accordance with the spirit of the Geneva Conventions. The Pentagon says that the allegations made by released British detainees about Guantanamo have not been found to be credible. Two Afghan men were killed in US custody at Bagram in December 2002. A US military pathologist certified their deaths as homicide. A criminal investigation into the deaths is still ongoing. 
The US has confirmed that 25 people have died in suspicious circumstances since the start of the war on terror. And Panorama has learnt of at least two other deaths, which do not feature on this list. The furore raised by the torture photographs has caused the Swiss government, guarantors of the Geneva Conventions, to formally remind the US and Britain there are no exceptions which justify torture. But some in the Bush administration have challenged those conventions, claiming they're outmoded in the post 9-11 world. In your view, you would not agree with those who say it's time effectively to go beyond the Geneva Conventions. They're no longer appropriate for the war on terror. Well, it's always a bit, I think our view is we are absolutely ready to discuss implications of new situations. We're not you know, stubborn to the extent that we say we don't see that there are, uh, that history moves on and things are, but what we say is as long as we have a given legal framework in place um, that is there, it should be applied in good faith by all actors in, involved. There are now six different US investigations, military and civilian, underway to determine exactly what went wrong at Abu Ghraib during the past nine months. Meanwhile, the Red Cross has revealed to Panorama that they still have concerns about the prison. Have you had occasion to revisit Abu Ghraib since your report, uh, this report uh, was put together? Have there been further visits? Indeed, in March this year, yes. And uh, are you satisfied with the conditions now in the prison? We felt that some of the uh, findings and recommendations that we submitted had been taken seriously, that on some issues corrective measures were taken, but there remained areas of concern for which we did request uh, further measures to be taken and, and would continue to look at in follow-up visits. Very so areas of concern still in Abu Ghraib? There were still certain areas of concern during our visit in March. The Pentagon has vigorously denied press reports this week, linking Donald Rumsfeld to the chain of command responsible for authorizing abuse at Abu Ghraib. They say there is no paper trail. I have a part of the responsibility, but I don't think all of the truth is known yet. So I, I'm waiting for the uh, other individuals who will share that responsibility with me. Mr. Rumsfeld met General Miller in Iraq, the man who replaced General Karpinski. He's now in charge of all Iraq's prisons. We'll be out here in these temporary detention. I've stopped reading the newspapers. <laughs> Donald Rumsfeld has made his apologies. Whatever the long-term damage to America, he's convinced he'll ride out this storm. It's a fact. I'm a survivor. 